Hello, my name is Natalie Doming, and I'm the Financial Literacy Program Coordinator at Atwater Library. The Financial Literacy Program at Atwater Library is made possible through funding from Canadian Heritage. Today I'm joined once again with Liz Heron from Atwater Library. Hi, Liz. And she's here to facilitate part two of Budgeting Basics, Protect Your Money and Online Resources. Thank you. And I'll give the floor over to you, Liz. Thanks, Natalie. It's always a good time to learn to be more aware of where you are and what you're doing online in order to better protect yourself and your information. For today, our goal is to provide tips and tools to raise consumer awareness and protect your information online. We'll review some online resources where you can do your own research to learn more about what you need to be aware of and when you're buying online, as well as tips you can use to practice to keep your personal information safe while shopping online. Throughout the presentation, we'll provide links to and previews of some reliable and useful websites where we can find information relating to considering what's important to us before and after a purchase, finding and using online tools to help compare products and prices, protecting your privacy online, and knowing how to proceed if you're not getting what you need. We won't review each site in detail, but we will show you what each page looks like and describe a little bit about why we think it's relevant. We encourage you to visit each site when you have the time. There's links to these websites available in the description below this video. As well, you can use search terms to search for and find these websites on the internet yourself. So, spending money can be stressful and intimidating. Sometimes you need to and have no choice but to purchase expensive items and services. Other times, you just want to add a bit more comfort to your life. Either way, there's things to think about before and after you buy so that you feel good about your purchase and are sure that you make the right decision for you. This first website, Build Your Buying Skills, offers things to think about before and after you buy. As you'll notice, there's a yellow heading near the bottom of this screenshot. The first point under that title, before you buy, so you'd have to scroll down to see the full thing, reminds us to stick to our budget. And it reads, stick to a spending plan to keep your finances in check. Ask yourself if this purchase fits into your budget. As we explored in Budgeting Basics Part 1, do yourself a favor and make your budget, especially since figuring out how much money we have to spend is an important first step to buying anything. As shown in this image, you can spot a search box on any web page by finding the magnifying glass icon. It's circled here in red. On this site, we can find information, advice, and tools from the Office de la Protection du Consumateur du Québec. This site has tips about buying specific large ticket items such as furniture, appliances, and vehicles, as well as smaller items such as clothing and groceries. Notice the search box on this different website, again here circled in red in the top in the middle. And also indicated with a red rectangular outline is the section dedicated to consumers. If you were to click on that section dedicated to consumers, this will display a menu again here, as you can see in this second screenshot. Click on the menu item at the left to view another clickable list of specific items at the right. This site is from the federal government of Canada and offers information specifically about financial services from the government of Canada. Notice the red arrow at the right you'll have to scroll down the page or move down the web page to find links to more specific information. Further down that same page, click any of the headings, for example, any of the ones you see here to get more information. You can always click the back button at the top left of the browser to go back to the previous page. That would be this one. In this section of the site, we can get tips related to certain life events like retirement, owning a home, or dealing with debt. You can Look at the headings here and see protecting consumers and merchants, managing your money, debt and borrowing, savings and investments, and many others. Before buying anything, smart consumers shop around and check out a number of sources. You can find almost every available product at more than one store. Comparison shopping doesn't always mean paying the lowest price. 
It means selecting the least expensive product that best suits your budget, your needs, your wants, your values, and your attitude. This first screenshot here is an example of the shopbot.ca website, and this is what that site would look like. You can find products either by searching, outlined here in the red circle, there's a search box, again identified by a magnifying glass icon, and you can browse through the categories identified here in the red rectangle. This site offers info about products like electronics and appliances. On another website you can use to comparison shop, this is CNET.com, and this is what it would look like. Again, you can find products either by searching, clicking that magnifying glass icon at the top right, or by browsing through categories, again, outlined in the rectangle at the bottom left. This site offers electronics like computers, tablets, or smartphones. Another great comparison shopping website is consumerreports.org, and this is what it would look like. Again, you can find a wide variety of products either by searching using the magnifying glass icon or browsing through categories. Here you can see a wide array and find a wide array of information on a lot of different products, anything from vacuum cleaners to washing machines to computers, anything. All right, so let's talk about consumer advocacy, where we can get information about our rights and responsibilities as consumers. Here's a great website, again offered by the Government of Canada. It's the Complaint Roadmap. You can use the links at the top of the page, as you see here, steps one through eight, to jump to a specific section, or use the scroll bar at the right to move down the page. At the top here, you can see those step-by-step -step instructions on how to tackle a consumer issue. Another great website is the Federal Consumer Protection Le Legislation, again also offered by the Government of Canada. Here we can find the federal agencies that regulate consumer issues related to all consumer issues. Again, notice the magnifying glass icon at the top right. You can click inside that text box, type your keywords or a phrase to search within the Canada.ca website. On that same page, if you scroll down, you can find links to federal consumer rights issues. Of particular note, you should check out the links to more information about the wireless services, privacy, and of course, so much more. For today, I've outlined in red here, information regarding the wireless services and the privacy information. This is what the wireless code webpage would look like. Here you can read about rights and obligations contained in your contracts with wireless service providers, like Bell or Videotron. It also tells you what you should expect from these providers and encourages you to understand your rights as a wireless service consumer. This is what the Privacy Commissioner of Canada site looks like. And on this site, you can find information like a summary of the privacy laws in Canada. There's also a lot more information than we realize, which is available in public records like our driver's license. You can scroll down this page, like you did many of the others, to see clickable links to get more specific information. You can click any of the headings you see there in the blue with the underline to get more targeted information. You see headings here like the summary of the privacy laws in Canada, information about our social insurance numbers, and how to raise a privacy concern with an organization. We'll not discuss every type of scan and fraud, as unfortunately there's so many that we would not have the time. We'll discuss one major type in particular and share resources where you should spend some time reading up on the subjects of most interest to you. Unfortunately, scams and fraud have never been more rampant. And with most of us staying home and using our devices a lot more, unfortunately we're more at risk than ever. Currently, we're all living in a time of heightened anxiety and fear, which are exactly the kinds of emotions that scams work best with. So a very important thing to do now more than ever is to slow down, read messages that appear on our screens, and do not just click OK or click a link because your friend shared it with you. Take the time to double check the source is legitimate and reliable. One of the most significant 
and dangerous types of scams is something called phishing. Scammers use email or text messages to trick us into giving our personal information. But there are several things we can do to protect ourselves. Phishing messages are designed to look genuine and often copy the format used by the organization the scammer is pretending to represent, including their branding and their logo. They'll take you to a fake website that looks like the real deal, but has a slightly different address. Some things to look out for or be aware of include the email or text message does not address you by your proper name and may contain typing errors and grammatical mistakes. The website address does not look like the address you usually use and is requesting details the legitimate site does not normally ask for. You may notice new icons on your computer screen or your computer is not as fast as it normally is. Essentially, we need to practice safe clicking. Do not click on any links or open attachments from emails or text messages claiming to be from our banks or other trusted organizations and which may be asking us to update or verify our account details. Just press delete. Do an internet search using the names or exact wording of the email or message to check for any references to a scam. Many scams can be identified this way. We can look for the secure symbol. Secure websites can be identified by the use of HTTPS rather than the HTTP at the start of the internet address or a closed padlock or unbroken key icon at the bottom right corner of your browser window. Legitimate websites that ask you to enter confidential information are generally encrypted to protect your details. And we'll discuss more about this in a minute. Imagine, you saw this in your inbox, the Netflix email here pictured at the right. Do you see any sign that it's a scam? Let's take a look. The email looks like it's from a company you may know and trust, Netflix. It even uses a Netflix logo and header. The email says your account is on hold because of a billing problem. The email has a generic greeting, hi dear. If you have an account with the business, it probably wouldn't use a generic greeting like this. The email invites you to click on a link to update your payment details. While at a glance, this email might look real, it's not. The scammers who send emails like this one do not have anything to do with the companies they pretend to be. Phishing emails can have real consequences for people who give scammers their information, and they can harm the reputation of the companies they're spoofing, they're pretending to be. If you get an email or a text message that asks you to click on a link or open an attachment, answer this question. Do I have an account with the company or know the person that contacted me? If the answer is no, it could be a phishing scam. Report the message, mark it as junk or spam, and then delete it. If the answer is yes, contact the company using a phone number that you've researched for on the internet or is perhaps available in your billing information or access a website you know is real. Open up the browser yourself and type that company's website address, never click those links. Attachments and links can install harmful malware. So it's important that you research this information yourself and don't make use of any of the links or information within an email or a text message you're suspicious of. Recognizing theft techniques, types of scams, protecting your information, and how to file a report, this is the kind of information you're gonna find from another great website from the Government of Canada. This is an agency called the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center. This is their website. At the right, you can see statistics about current scams. So between March 6th and May 25th, there was 100, excuse me, 1,005 reports of fraud. There have been so far 269 victims of fraud. And so far, or at least as of May 25th, there's been $1.8 million worth of fraud reported in Canada. You can scroll down this website to view clickable links. A particular note at the bottom of this page is information about spam laws in Canada and a link to get information on how to report fraud. You can click the Canada's anti spam legislation link under the heading other online resources on the bottom of this page. 
and here's what that website would look like. Here we can find information about how companies are allowed to contact us, how they're allowed to interact with us consumers, and our rights in regards to electronic communications. It's very useful, highly recommended you check this out. Again, you can scroll down that page to find links to even more resources and relevant topics, where you can understand the Canadian anti-spam legislation, you can take a quiz on your knowledge, and you can protect yourself by recognizing, reporting, and protecting your devices. Here's another site from the Government of Canada that provides resources on how and what to protect ourselves from the types of scams and frauds. Again, you can scroll down this page to find links to more relevant information, like the types of threats there exist and how to protect yourself. Each of these headings here are again clickable links. If you're finished or not, don't arrive at the site or page you want, you can always click the back button at the top left of your browser to come back to this page and continue reading. Here's another great website, again offered by the Government of Canada, Get Cyber Safe. Again, here you can see at the top right, circled in red, is another search box. You can use that box to search the site for keywords or phrases you might type. Or you can click the menu items from the navigation menu along the top of the site. In this screenshot, it's been outlined in the red rectangle. Furthermore, of course, you can always scroll down that page to find links to news articles about scams and terms like spoofing. So, as you're navigating the internet, there are some things to look out for and advice you can follow to help ensure your internet experience is safe. If you don't know who wrote what you read or why they wrote it, you don't know if it's a trustworthy site. This is a screenshot of a great document, a PDF file, also available in the description below this video. It's provided by Dalhousie University. And it's important to know what to look for when trying to decide whether a website is reliable, and there's a number of factors to consider. Again, here, Dalhousie University outlines six factors to look for when you're researching information on the internet. Privacy policies. Your personal information is very valuable. When you shop online, you give the seller information about yourself your name, your address, your email, your phone number, etc. The seller needs this information to complete your order, so it would be normal that you'd provide this information. Sometimes, but not always, the company will sell your information to another company without asking your permission. This can lead to unwanted emails from people and companies you don't know. They may also keep your information so they can send you ads, coupons, or special offers. You can find out how a company will use your information by reading their privacy policy. The privacy policy will tell you if they will share your information or sell it to anyone else. You'll usually find the company's privacy policy at the bottom of the website's homepage. In the examples you see here, the first blue stripe along the top, this is at the bottom of the Atwater Library and Computer Center's webpage. Here, circled in red, is a link to our privacy policy. The second example, as you can see based on the logo at the bottom right, is from the Government of Canada's website. Again, circled in red, you have the word privacy. That's a link that if you click on, you'd see the Government of Canada's privacy policy. What they would tell you they do with your personal information. But don't always trust what you read online. Fake information and stories are often spread through emails and websites. Just because a company has a website does not make that company or person legitimate. Be sure to do your research. Any website you log into with a username like an email address and a password, which could include your bank account, an internet-based email account or webmail accounts like Gmail, Hotmail, Outlook, Videotron, and even Bell. Social media accounts like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn and consumer accounts for online ordering like IGA or Metro or PayPal. It's important that you never log into an account if you don't see the HTTPS at the beginning of the address bar along the top of the browser. In terms of security, HTTP is completely fine when browsing the web. It only becomes an issue when you're entering sensitive data 
into form fields on a website. If you're entering sensitive data into an HTTP web page, that data will be transmitted in clear text and can be read by anyone. So, as you can see here, we have examples of what a secure website should look like in both the Firefox and Chrome browsers. You'll notice at the beginning of those website addresses in the address bar, at the top we have Firefox and it begins with HTTPS colon slash slash. The same thing in the Chrome browser, HTTPS colon slash slash. One main minor difference might be, like on the Chrome browser, there's also a little padlock icon. Those items in green can be clicked to verify or begin to understand more about the website's security. You should always avoid clicking links that have no context. Enter the website address in the address bar along the top of a browser yourself. As the pictures here demonstrate, every web browser has an address bar and is always available along the top of any browser. Some sites will offer a way for you to make your next login a little bit quicker. Don't do it. Although it does make it easier for us to access the account, it also leaves an open door for someone to invade our privacy, perhaps gather information or even take control over the account. If you're allowing websites to remember passwords, you should take the necessary steps to better manage your information. But before you sign out of any online accounts, make sure you know the username and password. All user accounts have usernames and passwords. All online accounts have settings where you can manage the information the website saves for you. If you don't know the current password and don't have it written down anywhere, be sure to reset the password before signing out of the account. To reset a password to an online account, go to the website where the service is offered. And somewhere within the login form, typically near the bottom, will be a link you can click on to begin the password reset process. Before you start this process, you should have a paper and pen to jot down the account details like the date, the new password, and the username associated with the account. As you can see here, Again, we provided two screenshots, two examples of different types of sites you might log into and the options they offer to save your information. The first one in blue is Facebook sign-in page. So once you were to enter your email address and then the password and those two text boxes provided, you could check that little box, keep me logged in. Don't recommend doing this. In the event that you've forgotten your password, you could go to the facebook.com sign-in page and click on the link or the information there circled in red, forgotten your password. And that would be on Facebook how you could trigger or begin the password reset information. Second, lower down on the page, a personal banking login. Again, you have a text box where you can enter your client number or card number. And you could tick a little box that says, remember me. Understanding this would make it quicker the next time you logged in, but is not recommended to do so. Should you forget your banking or other login information, the password, you could click, click on the forget your login link. And again, this would trigger and begin the password reset process. So don't allow the web browser to store your account details either. Depending on the settings of the browser you're using, you may see a pop-up like this asking for permission to save the account details, username and password. This is an example message we might see pop up in the Firefox browser. Remember, again, although it does make it easier for us to access the account, it also leaves an open door for someone to invade our privacy, perhaps gather information, or even take control of the account. So, as you can see here, I've outlined in the red, never for this site. And this again is an example in the Firefox web browser. Here's what it might look like in the Chrome browser. You should explore the settings of your web browser or any web browser you use because every browser, and in fact every program or app you use, has settings. You should keep your login information written down and keep it safe. Every password you ever create should be unique and you should not be able to guess it. Make sure that you sign out of any online account when you're done, that you close the browser window when you're done, 
with any online activity and empty the memory cache by clearing your browsing history. When you use the internet and a web browser, which as we know is the program that allows us to see and interact with web pages, those browsers will record your session, which just means that they'll keep a record of every website you've visited. Depending on your settings, it may even record your passwords and other information. You can delete the history of all your browsing session in any browser. And here's what those steps will look like in the Firefox browser. Number one, you'd go to the three lines at the top right of the browser, which is your options button. From there, you then click on privacy and security at the left. And then number three, you click the clear history button at the right. Once you click the clear history button, you'd be presented with a little pop-up window allowing you to choose more options. You can choose a time range like just today or everything that the browser has ever recorded. You can select the types of information you want to remove and that's indicated there with number five with the little check marks. If you want to leave certain pieces of information like your cookies, you could click to remove a check mark. If you want to be sure to include something to be erased, make sure there is a check mark there. Then number six, you'd click OK and your browsing history within Firefox would be erased. And here's what this would look like in your Google Chrome browser. Again, you're going to go to the three dots at the top right side of the browser and click on history from the menu. From there, you'd click on the clear browsing data underlined in red at the left here. You'd get a pop-up and within that pop-out, you'd need to choose a time range, like the last hour, all time. In number four here, you can see you'd have to select all the types of information that you'd want to erase. Again, having the check mark means it will be erased. Removing the check mark means it won't be erased. Then number five, you'd click that clear data button and your browsing history within the Google Chrome browser would be erased. It's really important and useful to know that you should only have one browser window and one tab open at a time when doing online banking or shopping to help protect against packet sniffing. When you send information across a network, like the internet, it's sent in packets. These packets of information can be intercepted using packet sniffing software, similar to eavesdropping on a com conversation. So, as you can see here in this screenshot, I have multiple, many tabs open, which is okay. I'm not logging into any of these sites. These are a lot of the government websites we're using as examples throughout this presentation. I'm not logging in. There's no information to be sniffed. None of my usernames or account details. However, if I was going to log into my bank account or perhaps shop online at Ikea or IGA, I'd make sure that I'd only have one browser window open and one tab open when I was about to enter my account information. Before entering it, I double check and make sure that it was HTTPS secure and then proceed. You can always open up a new tab as it is useful when you're browsing just for information by clicking on that plus sign as you can see in the rectangle at the top right. To close any of those tabs, each tab has their own individual X at the top right edge of that tab. Great. Usually when you update a software, you apply patches or add additional bits and pieces that keep the seller, excuse me, that the seller provides you for free. In theory, to keep your copy of the software in line with the official version, which is likely more stable, more secure, and may even provide you with some newer, better options. On the other hand, when you upgrade a software, you usually buy or pay extra for a version unavailable for free. Of course, an upgrade serves, could serve as an update as well in some cases. Replacing your product with a newer and often more superior version or a similar product. Therefore, an update modifies your current product keeps it up to date, while an upgrade totally replaces it. An example, let's say you have an antivirus program that you did not pay for. 
It's being made legally available for free, but which has a commercial version as well. You usually update its database to keep you safe from newer threats, but if you upgrade it, it means you pay for an advanced version, which may give you extended protection and a few additional features. Most importantly, make sure that your antivirus program is up to date. It may not be necessary to upgrade it. It is necessary to update it, whether you're using a free or a paid version. Antivirus software detects, prevents, and takes action to disarm or remove malicious software programs. You should always have one, an antivirus program, installed on your computer. For devices, there are antivirus apps you can install on your phone or tablet. You could visit CNET.com, the website featured here, to find user and editor reviews about available antivirus software and apps which leads us to trustworthy software. Installing only trustworthy software is key to keeping your device or computer secure. For computers, make sure you only download software from original sources. Try to get it from the companies and developers who made the software. And do not install free copies of expensive software you find on torrent sites. You should only install apps from the designated app store or known software developers available on your mobile device. Because there's not enough time in any one presentation to cover all you need to know, we wanna leave you with some search terms, keywords you could use to find more information about some of the things we've discussed today. Please remember too that the version of the operating system and the device you're using may affect how things work or are managed. So it's important to be able to search for the help you need with the devices and software you're using. If you're interested, you can download a copy of the handout that accompanies this presentation from the links in the description below this video. The final page of that handout includes a list of terms you might wanna to use to look up and find more information about. You can use these words to search the internet for more information to educate yourself. Open any web browser like Chrome or Firefox, type a search term, and tap enter on the keyboard. Here's an e another example of a Government Canada website. This is their search tips page. This is what this search tips page looks like. And here you'll find tips, which will help you to use the search tool to its fullest potential and to obtain the best search results possible both on the Government of Canada website and the internet in general. So use these search tips for your Google searches too. If you get there and you can scroll down the page, you'll find useful information about strategies and tips that you can use today to help find relevant, reliable information on the internet. We're all consumers and we all have the power. The surest way to be satisfied with purchases is to do some research first. Educate yourself to have a more informed discussion with suppliers and retailers. At the same time, consumers, we must be cautious of scams and frauds. There's government agencies and law enforcement bodies who have advice on how to avoid consumer scams, where to report them, and how to effectively handle consumer complaints. If you don't feel comfortable or satisfied, speak up. Stay safe and see you online. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. We certainly appreciate you being here today. I wanna to thank you for all this valuable information as we learn to navigate in this, uh, the internet in this day and age. Thanks again uh, to the Government of Canada, Canadian Heritage for making this possible. And also, I want to thank you, the viewer, uh, for watching today. If you have any questions, be sure to call us at the library. As you see here on the screen, we have our number up, or you can simply email me if you have any questions for Liz. And of course, we'll try to find the answers for you, or like we always say, point you in the right direction. You can also find all links uh, for everything that Liz mentioned in the video below the video. And we also have an evaluation form down there. If you have the time, please take a minute 
to fill it out so that we can keep bringing these programs to you. Thanks again. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned and stay in touch. Thank you, Liz.